Thank you for that, Tash. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you might want to open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, which is the passage we're looking at this morning. I'm going to pray for us, uh, and we're going to look at this portion of the Bible. Father, we do thank you that you reveal yourself in and through your word. We do pray right now as we look at your scriptures that we might not just receive it, but we might accept it as your very words to us so that we might be strengthened, so that we might grow, so that we might actually come to know and love you. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This week, uh, we're coming back to our series from 1 Thessalonians, and we're picking up where we left off in chapter 2. And those of you who are part of our evening church, I've told this story before, and you might be familiar with the story of a guy called Max Melitza. Max Melitza was a homeless man who was living on the streets of Utah. He lost touch with his family. No one knew where he was. And then in early 2011, his brother Morris died. And that's when the family hired a law firm to find him because his brother had left him a sizable estate. They told him the news on the streets of Utah. And as they told him the news, he received the good news. And all he had to do was turn up at New York City to claim his inheritance, an estate worth over 100,000 US dollars. No more living off the streets. No more looking for food in the bins. No more looking for shelter when it rained. And he organized to arrive in New York City on the bus. And on the day he was supposed to arrive, the family were waiting for him, but he never showed. And he never came. They waited, but he was not on any of the buses that arrived that day. He never turned up. Now, here's the thing. Receiving good news does not always mean people will accept the good news into their lives. Receiving good news doesn't always mean that people will accept the good news into their lives. Now, if you're watching online, and most of you are, there is an outline as we look at this portion of the Bible. Uh, you can go to gracepoint.org.au slash bulletin or, or slash sermon, and you actually find it there. Now, what we have in these verses is actually the very reverse. Because here in verse 13, you've got a group of people who have not only received the good news, they have actually accepted it into their lives as well. And so what I want to do with you this morning and this evening is I want to look at Thessalonians as a model, as an example of how the good news of Jesus must be heard before it's received and accepted. And let me say right at, a, at the start that there is a right way and a wrong way to hear and receive the message of Jesus. Because not all who hear and receive it actually accept it. Even those who call themselves followers of Jesus don't always rightly hear and receive and accept the good news Jesus offers. So if you're an online visitor joining us, or maybe you're part of a small group gathered uh, to watch our live stream each week, or maybe you're trying to work out how or what does it mean to respond to Jesus, well, this passage actually tells us. This passage tells us the kind of response we should be looking for and seeking and praying for as we make the good news of Jesus known. Let me remind you where we're up to in chapter 2. If you look at the opening verses of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, you discover Paul has been reminiscing about the time he spent with the Thessalonians. So he reminisced about his love for them, the time he spent with them, his care for them. And as he does that, he's actually filled with thanksgiving. And this is the reason why he gives thanks. Come with me to verse 13. We read, We also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it. Notice Paul constantly gives thanks whenever he looks back. Verse 1 to 12 tells us, verse 2 and verse 4 especially says, The good news of Jesus was declared, it was shared. It was proclaimed to the Thessalonian community. And so he gives thanks because it was declared to them. But notice Paul doesn't just give thanks because the good news of Jesus was shared. He doesn't just give thanks that the gospel came to them through him. Look at verse 13. Paul is filled with ongoing, continued thanksgiving because the word, as it was heard, was also received by the Thessalonians. You see there in verse 13? We give thanks because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, we are constantly thankful to God because you receive the good news about Jesus, which you heard from us. Now, notice that the good news concerning Jesus was heard before it was actually received. So, how did the good news of Jesus and his saving work come to the Thessalonian Christians? It was spoken, it was declared, it was shared before it was received. 
it, it was a word that was heard, which means it had to actually be spoken. Now, it is really, really important to get this, because there are people who will say to you, you don't have to be upfront and talk about Jesus. You don't have to be so open and talk about your faith. You just have to live it out. Live out your faith before others. You don't have to say anything. Let your light shine. Your witness in life is sufficient. Some people will say, that's enough. Well, that's a bit of a problem right now, isn't it? Because people around you can't see you in isolation, can they? No. It's, it's not just letting your light shine. The good news of Jesus must be spoken, declared, shared before it can actually be received by someone. Uh, I can model what's good for my kids, but if I don't speak and declare and explain it and teach it and communicate it, it's not going to benefit them, and it's certainly not going to benefit me. You try modeling generosity, what's good for your four-year-old, without actually explaining or instructing them. See what happens. Uh, the New South Wales Premier and Health Minister can model good COVID practices, right? Um, they can do that before the camera. They can stand in front of the camera for their daily briefing and not say anything. They stand 1.5 meters apart. They can wear masks. But if they don't speak, if they don't explain, if they, they don't communicate verbally, it doesn't benefit any of us. Imagine going diving for the very first time where there are no words spoken, where the instructor just models everything for you, that's not going to benefit you. In fact, it's going to be pretty unsafe. Uh, initiating a relationship with someone without words and trying to grow in that relationship without words, that's not going to work, is it? Because words are absolutely essential. That's the way we communicate. But also the means through which we reveal things about ourselves. Um, that's the way we make things known in, about ourselves. Words are the means by which we share our thoughts, our emotions, our desire. Life is not one big game of charades where we rely on people acting before us and we act before them. No, we need words to be understood and we need words to understand people. That's the reason why the good news of Jesus must be spoken, declared, shared, explained, taught, not just lived out before others. The saving work of Jesus cannot be known through charades. Why Jesus died cannot be understood if it's not explained. The difference Jesus makes cannot be comprehended if it's not clarified. This is how my faith has helped me. This is what gives me hope when the future looks uncertain. This is how I handle stress and anxiety as a Christian. This is how I face suffering and adversity as a follower of Jesus. This is how I approach family and parenting as a disciple of Jesus. Words give explanation and meaning and clarification to our living, our thoughts, our hopes, our joys, our security, our treasures, our beliefs. The gospel, the good news of Jesus and His saving work, cannot be shared without words. It cannot be proclaimed without words. In Romans chapter 10, verse 14, the Apostle Paul writes, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching or proclaiming to them? Now, Romans 10, 14 doesn't say, how can they believe in the one whom they have not seen? How can they see without someone acting in front of them? It doesn't say that, does it? It says, how can they hear without someone proclaiming to them? Or take 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. In 1 Peter chapter 3, 15, Peter writes, but in your heart set apart Christ. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Now, it doesn't say, does it? Peter doesn't say, always be prepared to act out an answer before everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope you have. It doesn't say that, does it? It says, always be prepared to give an answer, a verbal answer, to everyone who asks you to give you the reason for the hope that you have. Many of you have heard that often quoted saying, and I hear it around church, People say, preach the gospel, if necessary, use words. You've heard that, I've heard that. Preach the gospel, if necessary, use words. It's a quote attributed to Francis of Assisi. Now, can I say to you that it's absolutely wrong. It's wrong on two counts. 
There are two things wrong with that quote. Firstly, Francis did not say that. And there's nothing biblical about that. Words are absolutely necessary. Preach the gospel, and it is absolutely necessary to use words. Share Jesus and his saving work. Speak of why he died. Explain the significance of the death of Christ. Clarify the difference Jesus makes. It's absolutely necessary to use words. Now, for the Thessalonians who have received the good news of Jesus, it had to be heard. For it to be heard, it had to be spoken, declared. Now, that's the reason why, and I've often said this at Grace Point, there are two things every believer must learn to do. Two things every believer must learn to do. The first thing, you must learn to speak of Jesus and His saving work. You must learn to explain the good news of Jesus. That's called proclaiming the gospel. That's called sharing Christ. That's evangelism. That's speaking of what Jesus has done. That's making Him known. This is why Jesus died. This is the difference Jesus makes. And this is what makes Jesus different from every other religious worldview or religious world uh, leader. Uh, every religious leader, secular or religious, right? So every religious leader in the world says, this is what you must do to be saved. Uh, every religious worldview uh, believes in some form of salvation, right? It could be forgiveness, getting into heaven, reaching enlightenment, escaping the cycle of rebirth. And so every religious leader says, in history says, you must keep the law, you must be good, you must live the moral life, you must give alms, you must meditate, you must chant, you must achieve a certain level of spirituality or spiritual state. You must work to be saved. You must do to be saved. It's the same with secularism. Secularism believes in some form of salvation as well, even secular people believe in salvation. It could be the good life. It could be happiness. It could be having a successful career. It's having the house and the holiday home. It's financial security. It's retirement. And our secular leaders say, you must work to earn it. You must be prepared to make sacrifices to get it. You must save to achieve it. You must be master of your faith, and you must be captain of your soul. So you must work to be saved. You must do to be saved. And so religion and secularism says, work harder, you must do to be saved. Now Jesus says, stop working harder. Look at what I've done to save you. Trust me. And that's the reason why Jesus came and died. He lived a life for you that you could not live. Where you failed morally, ethically, relationally, He succeeds. He's done it for you, and He offers you His good life, so trust Him. Jesus died the death for you that you could not face. Where you have failed morally and ethically and relationally, He paid for it with His life. He does it for you, and He offers you His life as a sacrifice. Trust Him. And so Jesus saves, not by telling you to work harder, not by telling you to do, to be more moral, to be good, to pay back. Jesus saves, saves by telling you to trust Him because He's done it for you in His life and in His death. And if Jesus has saved you from the greatest danger in life, your sin, your death, and your judgment, if He saved you from that, surely He can save you and be your sufficiency with everything else in life. Surely you can trust Him with everything else in life. That's the first thing you must learn if you are to speak the good news of Jesus. You must be able to explain it. You must be able to clarify it. You must be able to declare it. You must learn to speak of Jesus and His saving work. But as followers of Jesus, I've often said there's a second thing we must learn to do. We must also learn to explain why we believe what we believe. That's called defending the gospel, right? The fancy term for that is apologetics, defending the gospel. Now, both these things, evangelism and apologetics, require words, so you must learn to speak of Jesus. Paul constantly gave thanks because the good news of Jesus and His saving work wasn't just declared, right? It was also heard. It wasn't just received by the Thessalonians, because now we also read it was heard, it was received, and it was accepted. The good news of Jesus was accepted. Notice how verse 13 goes on to describe how the good news of Jesus wasn't just received, but accepted. So look at verse 13. We thank God continually 
Because when you received the word of God, which you heard from, it, from us, you accepted it. Not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God. Now, here's the reason why Paul gives thanks. He gives thanks not just because the gospel was proclaimed and heard. He gives thanks also because the way the gospel was received into the lives of the Thessalonian Christians. Negatively, notice it was not received as a human word. Because a human word is a powerless word. It's a normal word. It's a simple word. And, and it's generally true, isn't it? We all long for words in our lives. No one wants to live uh, in isolation, uh, in silence. We long for words. We long for words that are reliable, words that are trustworthy. We long for words of love and affirmation, words that will bring us relief, words that will comfort us, words that will guide us. This is the reason why all of us, we only take advice from people we think have our best interests at heart. That's why we only listen and accept words from people we trust. That's why we, we seek advice. We listen to people who think are an authority or experts in the areas they excel in. And so you need financial advice, you see a successful financial planner. You want parenting advice, you seek advice from someone who does it well in their home. And that's why, you know, you want to improve on any instrument here at Grace Point, you speak to Aaron, who is leading singing today. And that's why you need to work out how to make those gains in the gym. You speak to Big Jason, who goes to the Burwood Evening Congregation, right? Some people's words in our lives are weightier and more valuable than other people. That's true of all of life. And the weight or value we give to the words of the other depends on who is doing the speaking. The greater their authority, the weightier and more valuable their words. The more powerful the one speaking, the weightier and more valuable their words. The more loving the one speaking, the weightier and the more valuable their words. And that's the reason why we don't trust certain words, do we? Uh, because of who's doing the speaking. So depending on who's doing the speaking, we either trust or don't trust them. And so I'll give you an example, right? When a politician makes great promises during election season, we tend to be very skeptical. Uh, when a car salesman tells you he's giving you the best possible price, you tend to disbelieve him. Sorry if you use car salesman. When a real estate agent tells you that they, they are working on your behalf to get you the best possible price from the seller, you tend not to trust them. The words spoken are only as good as the person doing the speaking. And the problem with people, and you and I know this, the problem with people is that people break their words. Their words are not always for our best interest. Their, the advice they give actually sometimes fail us. Their words are sometimes unreliable, and they don't often keep their promises. Yet we long for words of affirmation and love and security and comfort and guidance. Have you ever realized this? We all long for words of salvation. Everyone's looking for a word of salvation in their lives. The lonely wants to, be, to hear, you are loved forever. That's salvation for the lonely. The dissatisfied wants to hear, here's what will satisfy you forever. That's salvation for the dissatisfied. The suffering wants to hear, that here's healing forever. That's salvation for the suffering. The stressed out wants to hear, here's lasting rest. That's salvation for the anxious. That's why we're always looking for words that will bring lasting good news into our lives. We want reliable words. Promises kept, words of assurance, words that will tell us things are going to be okay, loving words that last, powerful words that help. We need the words of someone greater in our lives. Now, I want to say to you, it will never be found in another human being because we're not just powerless, we're also broken and imperfect in our love and commitment. But what if there was someone who was actually powerful and in control of everything around us? What if there was someone who was good and perfect in his love and commitment to us? Now, we all wish there was someone like that. In fact, we could certainly imagine that. Because imagine this, their word would certainly be worth listening to, wouldn't it? You see, the weight and worth of a word spoken to us is only as good as the one who speaks. Now, the Thessalonian Christians, they didn't hear and receive and accept the good news about Jesus as a powerless, broken, imperfect human word. No, they received it as the words of someone greater. 
someone greater than the suffering they were going through, someone greater than the brokenness they were experiencing, someone greater than the uh, out of control they felt in their lives. Friends, only the word of someone who is powerful can speak the words of lasting security. Who is only the words of someone who is absolute power can speak words of lasting security. And only the words of someone who is absolute love can speak with lasting comfort and love. And only God's word can actually do it. Only God's word can do it. And so you read positively, verse 13, notice, they accepted it as for what it was. They accepted it as what it actually is, the word of God. The good news of Jesus and his saving work came to them as God's word of absolute power in control every, over everything and as a word of absolute love, perfect love in their lives. It came to them as a reliable word, as a life-giving word in their personal crisis, uh, as relief in their suffering. We know they were suffering church, as hope in their uncertainty, and we know they were facing uncertainty, as comfort in their distress, as peace in their conflict. Church, have you ever realized this? God is speaking wherever the gospel, wherever the good news of Jesus is proclaimed, declared, and heard. God is actually speaking. He's issuing His call to come to know Him. He's extending His offer of forgiveness and cleansing from sin. He's offering His gift of lasting security and love that never ends. He's holding out His promise of eternal joy and pleasure. And Paul gave thanks because the good news of Jesus and His saving word was proclaimed, received, and accepted by the Thessalonian community. They welcome the good news of Jesus and His saving work personally in their own lives. Now, the Thessalonians are actually a picture of the good soil that Jesus speaks of in Matthew 13, which is why Natasha read that for us. So if you turn in your Bibles with me to Matthew 13, uh, it's also there in your version outline. You have a picture of what it means not just to receive Jesus and His kingdom, not just receive His call, His offer, His love, His salvation, but you also have a picture of what it means to actually accept the Word, not just up here, but in here, in your heart. Now, Matthew 13 is a familiar parable that Jesus tells. A parable is a fictional story, and Jesus, Jesus tells this story, and it's the story about four soils where seeds are actually sown. And in that parable, seeds are sown into the four soils, and the seeds represent the Word of God. Now, here's the thing. If you know anything about soil, I've been digging up my soil in the last week. We've been trying to put bushes in the front, and, and dirt just looks like dirt. Everywhere in the garden, it looks the same. The four soils, I can tell you this, they look the same. Uh, dirt is dirt, and the seeds fall on the four soils. And we read here that it's received, and we know it's received with joy. But this is what time will often reveal about the quality of the soil. Only in one part of the field is the soil good. Only in one soil does the seeds actually take root. The problem with the other three soils the seeds were all received. The seeds fell on them, but the roots were never deep. And so it never lasted. It was never accepted. And so very quickly, you've got the soil that fall, falls along the path. Uh, the word comes, and we read verse 19 of Matthew 13. It's heard. You see, the word is there. It's heard. But in a few moments, it's gone. It's forgotten. Now, some people are like that. They hear the good news of Jesus and His saving work, but then immediately it's forgotten. They hear the message of Jesus. It's piqued their interest for a moment. Tomorrow it's gone. Now, that's how some people hear and receive the message of Jesus. Birds came, took the seeds. Satan snatches away what's sown in the heart. Maybe that's some of you today. Tomorrow, it's forgotten. Then you've got the soil that falls among the rocks. The word comes. And notice verse 20, it's heard. You see that? It's received. Everyone receives it. With joy, we're told, with all the marks of enthusiasm. Some people receive the message of Jesus with joy, but then there is no root. It's short-lived. And so when trouble comes, when there's pressure, when there's hardship, when it's inconvenient, Jesus is rejected. He's dumped. When Jesus is no longer convenient, they bail out. Game over. Something else. I like the message about Jesus, but it's too hard to commit right now. That's how some people hear and receive the Word. Now, maybe that's some of you today. Then you've got the soil that falls among thorns. Notice it says, verse 22, it was 
heard, which means it was received. And again, there is no root because the worries of life, the troubles of life, when alternative treasures appear, when distractions come into life, the deceitfulness of shiny things, it begins to do what? It begins to choke out the seeds, its growth. It becomes unfruitful. It dies. And so the, the message of Jesus effectively gets choked out. Life's busyness, other distractions, life's other priorities, work and study and family, pushes Jesus out onto the margins. And that's how some people hear and receive the word. And maybe that's some of you today. Only in one soil does the word take root. Only in one soil does it bear fruit. And it's only found in the good soil. And so you notice verse 23. Again, the word is there. The word is heard, which means it's received, just like all the other soil. The word comes the same way. It is heard. But here's the difference. Have a look at verse 23. He hears the word and he understands it. Not just, I know it, right? It's not, oh, I've got information. Well, just because you've got information doesn't mean you understand it. Those of you who've done high school maths, university maths, just because you, you know a formula doesn't mean you understand it. Most people don't understand it. It's, this is real understanding. I have grasped its worth, its value. I know its significance in here, in my heart. For my life, there is heart understanding. Now, I say that because... Jesus says the problem between the soils is a heart issue. You read Matthew 13, verse 15. Here's the difference between the bad soil and the good soil. Here's the difference between bad soil and good soil when it comes to hearing, receiving, and accepting the word. We read verse 15, For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes which means they look like they're hearing, they look like they're receiving, but it's closed. The heart is callous. The, the idea there is the heart is calcified. It is rock hard. Nothing has taken root. But the good soil is different because we go on to read, otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Notice what Jesus says. Understanding with the heart is what makes the difference. That's Jesus' way of saying not just hearing and receiving it here, but in here. Taking hold of its truth, taking hold of its value, its worth, its significance, its greatness, its power, and embracing it in my life personally, such that it leads to a turning away from everything else and a trust in Jesus, and a turning to Jesus. That's what Paul gives thanks for in the life of the Thessalonians. In fact, we, we see this very change in the lives of the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Because chapter 1 tells us how they received and accepted the good news of Jesus. We read, they received the good news of Jesus as words of relief and comfort, as words of provision, as words of power, as words of security and love in their distress, in their in their, in, their, in their pain and suffering, in their persecution, in their uncertainty. Now, look with me very quickly, chapter 1, verse 6. Chapter 1, verse 6 of 1 Thessalonians, uh, we read, even when there's pressure and persecution and loss and suffering, even when all those things were pressing it into their lives, we read, they welcome the gospel. They accepted the gospel into their lives with joy. And so here is proof. They didn't just hear and receive and accepted the word. They received and accepted the word as God's word of power and love in their lives. Unlike the seeds that fell on the rocky and thorny ground. Suffering, hardship, worries, and wealth did not derail the word in their lives. And then we read in verse 9, we read of a change. They bore fruit. Notice, they turned from idols to serve the living and true God. They turn from idols to serve the living and true God. They no longer look to find their relief and their security in life's distractions. They no longer look to, to find their value and their worth and power and love in anything else but God Himself, in Jesus who saved them. They receive the message of Jesus' saving work as God's Word to them in here. And what takes place is a turning away from everything else and trusting Him just like the seeds that fell on the good soil. They heard the word, they received the word, they understood it, they grasped its worth and value in the heart, and they turn away from everything else 
and they turn to Jesus to receive what he offers. And so the Thessalonians too are a picture of good soil. This is how the word of the gospel is supposed to be heard and received and accepted, accepted with, with total acceptance, with total joy that overflows into a life that turns to Jesus. And that's what we read in chapter 2, verse 13. Don't know whether you've ever realized this. Everyone, religious people, irreligious people, Christian people, secular people, everyone across our city, across our world, everyone is looking for a word of salvation. And whenever Jesus is proclaimed, declared, or shared, everyone hears and receives the good news. You see, the message of Jesus is actually received by all people, but not everyone accepts it. Because people can receive the word about Jesus as nothing more than a human word, uh, a powerless, deficient human word in their lives. Now, the great tragedy is that even if you reject the good news of Jesus in your life, you're still looking for a word of salvation. We all are. And so my question to you is this. Where are you going to find a better word, a more powerful word, a more loving word, a more secure word? Every other word will tell you to work harder, to do more, to earn your way, to depend on yourself. Jesus says, I lived the life for you that you could not live. Where you failed morally, ethically, relationally, I've succeeded. I've done it for you, and I'm offering you my good life. Trust me. Jesus says, I died the death for you that you could not face. Where you failed morally, relationally, ethically, legally, I paid for it with my life at the cross for you. I've done it for you, and I'm offering you the sacrifice of my life. Trust me. Friends, don't you think a word, that this is a word worth personally accepting today if you haven't done it already? Some of you I know have joined us for over 20 weeks on the live stream, and you've been trying to work out, what does it mean for me to respond to Jesus? Well, here it is. Trust Him. Now, the second thing I want to say to you as we close, especially if you're a regular at Grace Point, making Jesus known, making the message of Jesus known, always brings a response in those who hear it. The problem is never with the word that is heard. The problem is never with the message about Jesus shared with family and friends. The problem is that some soil are bad and some soil are good, right? Now, often we focus on the bad soil. We think, oh, no one's going to respond. But remember in the parable Jesus tells, there is bad soil, but there is also good soil. But until the powerful, all-loving word of the gospel is shared and spoken and declared and explained, the heart of the people in front of you remain uncovered. We can't tell what soil is actually present. Has it ever occurred to you that it is as you make Jesus known, as you explain why Jesus died, that God is uncovering the soil? And it's not meant to discourage you, because notice there is also good soil. Many of you listening today are evidence of the good soil because someone actually proclaimed and shared the good news of Jesus with you. And you heard it, and like the Thessalonians, you received it, and you accepted it, and it changed your life. You read Acts chapter 13, verse 45 to 48, and there you also have this picture uh, in the ministry of the apostles of the words of the gospel, the seeds falling on soil, and we do read Acts 13, verse 45 to 48. Some rejected the word of the gospel, and others we read, when they heard it, they were filled with gladness. They were filled with joy and thankfulness. They honored the word of the gospel by accepting it. Let me read that for you. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad, they were filled with joy, and they honored the word of the Lord. And all who were appointed to eternal life believed. The good soil was uncovered. But notice this only takes place as the good news of Jesus is heard, which means it has to be shared, declared, spoken. The gospel must be proclaimed and heard before it can be received and accepted. And that's why the Apostle Paul says, as he speaks of the Old Testament people of God, Romans 10, verse 11 to 17, a passage that's familiar to many of us, we read, 
as Scripture says, anyone who believes in Him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all. God richly blesses all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone proclaiming to them? And how can anyone proclaim unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, here it is, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word about Christ. And that's a word that he's given you. As you've heard, received, and accepted the good news, let me encourage you to keep speaking of Jesus. Not just proclaiming the good news of Jesus, but explaining why Jesus died. Sharing how he's made a difference in your life. Because as it is heard through you, it will be received by everyone. And some will accept it as the very powerful and loving word of God. Some will accept it as God's saving word to them in Jesus. Please join with me in prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you that you are not silent. All of us are looking for a better word in our lives, words that are reliable and trustworthy, words of love and affirmation, words of security and comfort. We long for words of salvation. And so we thank you this morning and this evening that you have spoken good news to us in Jesus who died for us. Help us to not just hear and receive this, help us to personally accept it in our lives by trusting Jesus and entrusting all our failures, our disappointments, worries, cares, and concerns, and needs to Him. Help us also to speak, to declare, to proclaim, to share your good news in Jesus who died for us. To all we will meet, give us boldness, give us opportunity, give us words, so that those who hear might not just receive it, but accept it as a saving word in their lives. Amen.